you got a Bible with you, say yes. And let me invite you to open it with me, the New Testament book of Acts. Acts chapter 17 is where we find ourselves this morning. I want to go ahead and let you know next Sunday we begin a series entitled Engage. You're going to come Sunday and actually receive every single family in our church a family devotional guide for you. So you'll be a part of that series, not only uh, with your family throughout the month of July, but also with your community group. So on Sunday evenings, you have an opportunity to get together with your community group and really uh, be challenged to grow in your faith as we talk about prioritizing a missionary lifestyle. Now this morning, I want to talk to you on the subject, Obsessed with Making Disciples. Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 16. If you've got it there, with you'll stand with me in honor of God's word this morning. Acts 17, verse 16, you got it there in front of you, say yes. And the Bible says, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, uh, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with them and some were saying, what would this idol babbler wish to say? And others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to Arabacus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. So as Paul stood in the midst of Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, that the God who made the world and all the things in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and of earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God and perhaps they would grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own prophets have said, for we also are his children. Well, being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now is declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because he's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now, when they had heard this, about the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, We shall hear you again concerning this. And so Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed. And among those are Dionysius and Arapagat. And I said both of those names right. Can I get a witness on that? If you got a better pronunciation, blessings on you, all right? And then the Bible says, And a woman named Demarius and others with them. Let's bow together. Father, we are grateful uh, for your word this morning. I want to pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would speak to our hearts. God, we want to be a church body obsessed with making disciples. Uh, Father, we want to be about the mission that you have given to the New Testament church. We don't want to make up our own thing. We just want to follow hard after you. So speak to every heart here today, especially, Lord, those who don't have a relationship with you. Draw them to salvation as you have seen fit to sovereignly bring, him, bring them here today. Uh, to hear the truth of Jesus Christ. So redeem them and we'll give you glory for it. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said, Amen. So you can be seated. Just finished reading a book about Zappos. Zappos is actually an online internet retail store. And the book was written by Tony Shea. And in that particular book, it's pretty amazing because Tony Shea talks about how he has sought to lead an organization to be absolutely obsessed with customer service. Now, Tony Shea also has put forth a core value in their uh, organization that they would wow every single customer. Uh, Tony Shea has linked up now with Jeff Bezos of Amazon. Many of you have heard of that online organization as well. And together they have uh, combined their companies because Jeff Bezos also has this great desire to be obsessed with customer service. 
Now, the reason I'm bringing this up to you is because as I was reading that book, I wrote down in my journal after I had read the statement that they were obsessed with customer service, I wrote down a question for myself. Uh, What would I look like, Levi, if I were obsessed with making disciples? And then I kind of went a little further in my own mind and heart. I began to wonder what would the church look like if it were obsessed with making disciples? See, if you think about Tony Shea and even Jeff Bezos, you've got two individuals who are living in our culture right now who are spending every waking moment thinking about, strategizing, trying to think through their business model about how they can make people happy, about how they can uh, really obsess over the customer. And here these are uh, two individuals who are giving their entire lives to something that is not eternal. Uh, Both Zappos as well as Amazon will one day be businesses that fall apart. All of them do. But you and I as followers of Jesus Christ have been redeemed. We've been placed into the New Testament church. And we're not an organization, but we are an organism. So we are alive. We're not temporary, but we are eternal. And I'm thinking to myself that if these two individual men will spend their lives on something that has no eternal value, and they are passionate about it, How much more passionate should followers of Jesus Christ be at making disciples, which is the mission that Jesus has given to the church? So whenever we talk about making disciples, so we're on the same page here, when I talk about a disciple, I'm talking about one who is a willing follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've described a disciple here at Concord as one who worships, reaches, grows, and serves. That is, they worship Jesus with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, that they reach out with the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who are far from God and share the good news so that individuals might be saved. Also, an individual who is a disciple is one who grows. That is, they have a desire to mature in their faith. And so they pursue spiritual maturity. And then they serve in the body of Christ. They serve using their God-given spiritual gifts. Those are disciples. We want to be a church that is producing disciples. But we also want to be a church that is obsessed with making disciples. Not that you simply would come here, not that I would simply come here, and we would learn about discipleship, but not put it into practice. Uh, We want to be individuals who learn from God's Word and then actually go out into the communities with the Word, seeking to do what God has actually called us to do. So what I did this uh, past week is where I felt like the Lord was really leading me uh, to talk to you this morning about what a church would look like if it were obsessed with making disciples. And what I did is just basically looked at Paul's life in Acts chapter 17, as we've read already, and looked at how he responded, how he acted, said, okay, what will we look like? What should a church look like? And so I got three things for you this morning. Are you all ready to say yes? And uh, these are legit, so listen closely. The first one is a church obsessed with making disciples is righteously angry about the enemy's ability to propagate a false ideology. A church obsessed with making disciples is righteously angry about the enemy's ability to propagate a false ideology. Acts chapter 17, verse 16, again in your Bible. Uh, While Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. Eugene Peterson paraphrases it this way, the longer Paul waited in Athens, the angrier he got. All those idols, the city was a junkyard of idols. I want you to think about that word provoked. That's what the Bible says. And you've got to see Paul the Apostle. He's hanging out in Athens, not Georgia, by the way. But he's hanging out there. And as he peers out into the scene, what he begins to look at are individuals who are worshiping false gods. And so the Bible now says that he is provoked within. The word provoked, if I could kind of give you an equation, it would simply be compassion plus anger equals being provoked. Uh, The reason I mention compassion is because Paul the Apostle is brokenhearted over what he sees. He cannot believe that individuals are turning from the one true and living God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and worshiping idols that they themselves have created out of stone, out of gold, and out of silver. So he is brokenhearted over them. There's a wave of empathy that comes upon his life as he sees individuals living apart from the truth of Jesus Christ. I mean, I pray that you experience that as well. Uh, there have been times in my life where I've experienced it. I've asked the Lord, even after I've studied this text, that I would experience it even more. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples. One, 
uh, whenever I flew over Africa uh, for the first time, I remember looking out the window down at the country. And as we flew past those particular areas, you could see the lights flickering down below us. And I remember being overwhelmed by the fact that there were thousands upon thousands, even millions of individuals in that country who did not have a personal relationship with Jesus. And so I felt compassionate. I'm like, how in the world can people live without Christ? What can we do about it? So my heart was breaking. I remember in Brazil as well, uh, Darren and I, Darren's a, a member here, he goes to our 930 service, but he and I were in a hotel, we were sitting there eating uh, supper, I believe it was, that evening. And all of a sudden there was this massive ruckus on the street. So we went to the uh, door, we looked out, and we began to see mobs of people walking behind uh, someone who was holding up a huge shrine. And inside the shrine there was a uh, little picture of a, a God that somebody had formed out of their own hands. But there was a, when I say a mob, I mean thousands and thousands of people walking behind this thing. And as we looked at that, uh, we both were over. How could people be so fooled? How could they fall for something that is not true? You see, that, that's where compassion now leads to a little anger. And this is an unrighteous indignation. It is righteous indignation. And Paul the Apostle was not angry at the people. Uh, it was Paul the Apostle who wrote, We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities of darkness. So his anger now is not directed towards individuals, but toward the enemy who continues to feed over and over again all of these false ideologies to people, and they are falling for it. And so he is provoked within. You can see him there, a mixture of great compassion, but also this righteous indignation where he wants to do something. You know, he was obsessed with making disciples. And his obsession caused him to be righteously angry over the ideologies that were being shared. But I want you to note, he didn't hide his head in the sand. He didn't turn his back on the culture. He didn't try to create a little place where he could go and be safe. As a matter of fact, he did something tremendous, which leads me to the second point this morning. A church obsessed with making disciples does not ignore the culture where God has planted them. So what did Paul too, do? Look at 17 and 18 of your Bible, those two verses. The Bible says, He was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every single day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. And some were saying, What would this idle babbler wish to say? And others, He seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So we see here, Paul the Apostle doesn't ignore, but he engages the culture. Two major locations where Paul the Apostle preached Jesus and the resurrection. Uh, one was a synagogue. This was pretty normal of Paul's routine. He would enter into a new city. He would go to the synagogues. Uh, those are the places where the Old Testament scrolls were kept. And so Paul the Apostle would go into the synagogues. He would stand up. He would read from the Old Testament scrolls. And then he would preach Jesus to those who were present. He would talk about the prophets of the Old Testament. How they were actually speaking about Jesus Christ as the Messiah who would come to the earth and die for the sin of humanity, be buried and resurrected. And then he would call them to repentance. He would encourage them to turn from their self-effort to impress God, realize that they are sinners, see that the law of God in the Old Testament is given to show you your sin and point you to Jesus Christ. So he would encourage them, turn from your old way of thinking and living and trust the Lord Jesus Christ who will redeem your soul. So he would begin that message in the synagogues. Now what's interesting is that Paul uh, had a habit of getting kicked out of the synagogues. Are y'all listening? Uh, individuals didn't necessarily want to listen to that. And so then he would go to the marketplace. Now the marketplace in this text is the center of city life. You can have imagined it, uh, if you will. They still have some of these uh, particular arenas over in uh, European countries. But typically there's a large uh, city square. Uh, city square, though, is just flat. Uh, there's nothing there. It's just a marketplace. It's where go, people go and hang out. And then in the corners of the city square, oftentimes people would put up soap boxes. So we got that idea of soap box, standing on your soap box. And they would stand up and they would deliver their message. And so people did this all the time. You got to remember, right? During these days, they didn't have computers or iPods or iPads. 
So they would actually go to the city square so that they could hear and be entertained. So Paul the Apostle went straight to the marketplace. And he would stand up oftentimes, uh, possibly even on a soapbox, and he would declare the message of Jesus Christ. Now what's awesome is, when he would go to the synagogues, he would start where they were, the Old Testament law. But whenever he would go to the marketplace, he wouldn't start with the Old Testament. Instead, he would start with the reality that there is one creator, God. And we'll see that in just a moment in his messages. But what's amazing here is that Paul doesn't hide his head in the sand at a lost culture. He is provoked, and listen to this, when you are genuinely provoked by the Lord, you will do something about it. And that's what Paul did. Paul went in, he engaged. Did y'all see the two philosophies that he really faced? There were Epicureans and there were Stoics. Now the Epicureans actually teach, uh, basically, that you do whatever you want to do to make yourself happy. Uh, They teach, as long as it doesn't hurt someone else, do it as long as it makes you content and happy. So they encourage a lifestyle of pursuing contentment by what the world can offer them. Can I tell you that's a very common thing today? It's the same thing people teach today. Right? As long as you're... I even heard it on Fox News recently. A commentator said it just like that. Hey, as long as you're not hurting anyone else, and if it makes you happy, you go for it. And so that's what individuals are living with even today. Matter of fact, remember the book I told you about, about Zappos? Uh, The underscript of that book, or the subtitle rather, is just simply delivering happiness. If you've ever ordered something from Zappos, it comes in a box and it actually says delivering happiness on it. Can I tell you, when you open the box up, it ain't going to make you happy? Are y'all listening? That is actually an Epicurean philosophy. And even as I read the book, it was amazing how Tony Shea has been sucked into that particular ideology, and he now is teaching his entire business organization. If it makes you happy, do it, as long as it doesn't hurt somebody else. So that was the Epicurean way, same thing we face today. But also there were the Stoics. The Stoics were pantheist in their theology. That is, they believed the universe was God, and that God was the universe. Some of them would go so far as to even say because they were a part of the universe that they themselves were gods. But you know, that's the same secular, humanist concept that we have today. There are individuals who believe the universe is eternal. That's why it's so important that we save it. That's why they elevate the fact, the secular humanists, that the only thing that will save us as a race or as humanity is education. So they push education as the savior of the world. That's secular humanism. And many of them are walking down the same path in the Stoic tradition where some of them would actually say, doesn't matter what you worship, doesn't matter who you worship, as long as you are sincere in your heart, as long as you believe it in here. And that's Oprah Winfrey's theology. And that Stoic theology is what Paul the Apostle was actually speaking to. Now I want you to think about this because this is amazing, right? The same philosophies that you read about in ancient history are the same philosophies that are among us today. So what does that tell us? It tells us that those ancient philosophies are just recycled, rebranded, and renamed decade after decade after decade. And nobody today stands up and says, we're Epicureans. They don't say, we're Stoics. But they hold the same philosophies. And that's what Paul the Apostle was speaking to. And check it out, that's also what you and I are speaking to in our culture. Now, G.K. Chesterton, uh, who's a... A uh, pretty brilliant individual uh, has written a book called The Spiritual Man. And in that book, here's what he says. He says, basically, and I'm going to give it to you uh, in a simple form. He says, the cross of Jesus Christ redeems you from the cycle of endless ideologies. Now, what you think about that? If every single ideology that's alive today is really just a recycled circle of ideas that continues to come back around, back around, back around every single decade. But when you turn to the cross of Jesus Christ, that's when you are redeemed from that cycle. And you're given a brand new life in the Lord Jesus. And listen, that's what people need today, isn't it? Now, Paul the Apostle saw his culture, provoked within him compassion, spiritual righteous indignation. Then he engaged the culture by talking to them And he preached Jesus and the resurrection. Remember last week we talked about when's a good time to preach the word. Anybody remember? 
Yeah, all the time. That's what Paul the Apostle was doing. He was sharing the good news of Jesus Christ all of the time. And he's facing so many different situations. Now, I want you to note this morning, all right? And I want you to listen to me, all right? Eyeball to eyeball. Come here just a second. Uh, you and I are missionaries. As soon as you came to faith in Jesus Christ, I think it was Tony Evans who said, you didn't get on a cruise ship, you got on a, a battleship, all right? So you're a follower of Jesus now. You are fighting hell by the acre with the good news of Jesus Christ. And as a missionary living in this culture, these counties, Hall, White County, Lumpkin, Habersham, wherever you live, you're a missionary there if you know Jesus. And as a missionary, you begin to get to know your culture so that you can engage them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what I've found since I've been here is that many individuals in our culture, they, they know about Jesus. They've heard the stories of him. Uh, they might even be able to quote some Bible verses. Uh, verses. Uh, they're pretty religious individuals. In fact, if I ask them, if you died now, where would you spend eternity? Uh, 99% of the people I ask that question say, heaven. I say, well, how are you so sure? They immediately in that moment begin to talk about how good they are. I'm a good, pretty good person. Right? I, I mean, I, I, I try to treat everybody the way I want to be treated. You know, I, I've been in church uh, many times, and not, maybe not as faithful as I used to be, but I used to go to church all the time. I was baptized. You know, my grandparents were involved in church. They helped start that church down there on the corner of that. It's amazing how they will begin to wrap out all of their self-deeds. That's the culture you and I live in. So how do we engage a culture with the gospel that's wrapped up in religion? And there's a massive difference. Matter of fact, another book, it has a comparison between religion and gospel. And I want you to listen to this, okay? Because I want you to see this morning uh, if some of you might be caught up in religion as opposed to a relationship with Jesus Christ. All right, by the way, uh, your answer to that will determine whether or not you go to hell for eternity. So you might want to pay very close attention to this one, all right? So here, here's what religion says. Religion says, I obey, therefore I am accepted. Religion says, I, I, I'm doing the right thing, so God has to accept me. I'm doing the right thing, so God has to be pleased with me. That's religion. All right? The Bible says there's no one righteous, no, not one. Here, here's what the gospel says. I'm accepted by God, therefore I obey. There's a difference there. Listen to what religion says as well. It's motivated by fear and insecurity. So individuals are motivated to obey because they have this cosmic killjoy God in their mind that they have created that they think, okay, if I do this thing, God's going to love me more. But if I do this, he's going to love me less. That's religion. Uh, the gospel is motivated uh, by grateful joy. Grateful joy. And I want you to listen, okay? When you come into the reality of the gospel... You see a, a God who unconditionally loves you. Uh, this means you can't do anything to get God to love you more. And you, you can't do anything to get God to love you less. What you do and what I do uh, doesn't have the capacity to somehow impress God. But because God is unconditionally loving toward us and because he has poured out grace upon us and forgiven us of our sin we with grateful joy now are motivated to honor him and check this one out uh, religion says i obey god in order to get things from god but here's what the gospel says i obey god to get god to delight and resemble him. Now think about that, right? Or some of you, some of you came to church this morning and thought, I'm gonna go to church, and then the Lord's gonna have to fill in the blank. Really? If that's your attitude or mindset, you're caught up in religion. You may not know Jesus personally. And there is a difference there. I remember one guy actually came to me and said, Hey, and this wasn't here by the way, all right, so don't think I'm talking about one guy here. But uh, he came to me and said, hey, I read the book of Revelation because it said if you read that book in full, uh, you'll be blessed. And so I read it because I was playing in a golf tournament that weekend and I still lost. I'm like, yeah, you, you missed the point, man, right? He's caught up in religion. But that's where we are. So we run into individuals in our communities who live right next door to us, who work with us, who go to school with us, and they can tell you Bible verses. 
But when it gets down to the reality of whether or not they have a relationship with Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for their sin, was buried and resurrected, they're still confident in what they have done instead of placing their confidence in what Jesus has done. So what do we do with individuals like that? We just ignore them? We're like, well, they don't get it. Well, I'll never be able to figure it out. We don't do that. That's not what Paul did. Paul was provoked. He understood the enemy was the one who blinded their eyes. He had such compassion that he moved forward. Did not hide his head in the sand. But he used by God right where he was planted. Let me just give you this. Man, I got too much to preach and not enough time. Good night. Uh, the, this is kind of what I've been praying and thinking through, man. The church, uh, my prayer, that the church would see itself as planted by God in a particular culture with the express purpose of evangelizing those far from God by telling them about Jesus and the resurrection. Can y'all get down with that and say, yeah? It's like, let's just evangelize those who are far from God. Let's go and try to help them come to see the truth of Jesus. Uh, a church that would take intentional steps to prepare and send those within the congregation out with the truth of Jesus to engage the culture in which they live. So we want to be equipped here as we gather together as a fellowship so that we can move from here to there with the good news of Jesus Christ. Not hiding from the culture, not trying to build a little place where we can all hide out together and, and talk about how we know the truth and everybody else is dumb. That's not the goal, all right? The goal is we know the truth, we grow in the truth, and then we move out with the truth so others can come to know the truth. All right, that goes to the third statement here I want to give to you. A church obsessed with making disciples shares the message regardless of the outcome. All right, now I've got to go quick here, okay? So you've got to see Paul. He's hanging out. All of these false uh, worshipers are there. And uh, he's so stirred up in his mind and in his heart uh, by the Spirit of God that he stands up and he's like, I'm, I'm fixing to deliver some truth here. And he preaches a message. This is awesome to be able to, to read uh, Paul the Apostle's sermon. So look, look at verse 23, and then we'll just break down a few things here. He says, while I was uh, passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Now, y'all think about that, right? They created all of these false gods, and then they were like, what if we forgot one? He said, Here, well, let's just make an inscription that says to an unknown God. That's what it is. That's to cover their bases, man, just in case. And then he says, therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. And this is huge. The God who made the world. Remember I told you he starts with creator, God. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is a Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. So Paul here, he magnifies God as the creator of the universe. And what he's doing really is he's kind of using a play on words like, you guys are out there building and creating your idols but i need you to know something god created you and then he goes uh it's, it's pretty wild right so you can't give god anything don't y'all look at me real quick all right i bought an eyeball here's the deal uh god you guys have seen jerry Maguire possibly on tbs right before where they see each other in the room and finally they say uh you complete me and then all the ladies start crying y'all know what i'm talking you remember this don't leave me hanging by myself Y'all act so spiritual, you've never seen the movie. But anyway, so there it is, crying. You complete. God never has said that to an individual. We don't complete God. God is sufficient in and of himself. He does not even remotely need e any of us. He doesn't need us. He's sufficient. Verse 26, uh, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Check this out. Having determined the appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. You know what this is saying? Uh, Paul's saying, hey guys, look, look, you, you're out there creating gods that are false. I want to talk to you about the unknown God. He's the one who created you. And he actually determined the time frame in which you would live. And he also determined, listen, where you would live. Why is that? Verse 27. That you would seek after God. If perhaps you might grow for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. And so here, uh, it's pretty awesome. God has chosen the time frame in which you'd be born. He chose the place in which you'd be born so that you would have the optimal opportunity to reach out for him. 
And if you reach out for him, Paul's like, he's not far. Well, verse 28, uh, in him we live and move and exist. And even some of our own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and the thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, I bet that went over well with the crowd. Y'all with me on that? It's like, God sees y'all. God's created. But, hey, listen, he'll overlook the fact you're ignorant. Uh, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should, what's your Bible say? Yeah, repent. All right, lift up your voices. What does it say? One, two, three. Yeah, repent. Uh, That literally means have a change of mind, a change of heart, change of the will. Change your mind about who God is. It's not all these false gods. Hey, listen, sir. Uh, God is not your workplace. Uh, God is not your wife. God is not your children. Uh, God is not your sports. God is not your education. Repent. Change your mind about what you think about God. God is not your religion. And then change your heart. They're they're so affectionate uh, towards these idols. And isn't that true in our day? People are so affectionate. Uh, they, they, They lend their heart to things upon this earth in pursuit of happiness in pursuit of joy in pursuit of contentment it's like let's get everything we can here in the world maybe this will make me happy maybe this will help me maybe this... and we put that there and we're still empty and paul's like repent change of heart turn your affections now towards jesus who died to pay the penalty of your sin which is death and hell was buried and resurrected turn to him affections on him and him alone this is a change of the will it's like quit worshiping those idols. Uh, it's a will. It means to act. It means to do. Now, worship the Lord Jesus. That's what he said. He's calling every man to repent. You know what I like about that? That's still true today. But you're under the sound of my voice, and some of you are here today, and you may be very religious. Uh, you, you may have a stoic concept. Uh, you may even have an Epicurean concept. And so it's like, well, what's the message? What would, it, what would the Lord say to me today? Here's what he say. Repent. Change your mind, change your heart, change your action. Quit living for a lie. Be redeemed out of the endless cycle of man's ideology. Verse 31. I just heard a bell. I think that means it's just turned 12 o'clock. Are y'all with me? Or either that means round two. Can I get a witness? 31. uh, The Lord's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man... Whom he has appointed, uh, he's talking about Jesus there, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. I love this. How do we know that God accepted the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross as sufficient to forgive men of their sins? How do we know that? Here's how we know, because Jesus got up from the dead. That affirms it, it confirms it, that indeed he's the one. And the Bible says God has made Jesus to be the judge of all of the world. So ultimately, every person will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you've rejected Jesus, you'll be rejected by Jesus. If you've received Jesus, you'll be received by Jesus. And listen, rejection of Jesus, it doesn't have to be you spitting in his face while you're here on the earth. You may very well be a guy who's like, yeah, Jesus is fine if that's what y'all want to believe. But it's, you know, I'm going to do my own thing here. You don't have to be ugly about being rejecting of Jesus but you're still rejecting verse 32 and this is good right here right they heard of the resurrection of the dead and some began to sneer uh, that word sneer means to mock to make fun of and you can see them right uh, Paul's like hey uh, Jesus died was buried and resurrected y'all turn from your idols turn from what you think is going to bring you contentment and joy and trust the one who created you. God, who sent Jesus to die for you, was buried and resurrected. And then they begin to hit each other. Resurrection? This guy's nuts. He's lost his mind. And then they begin to make fun of him. Hey, Paul, maybe you got up from the dead. Maybe you're crazy. They just lay it all out there. So they're sneering him. Then, then others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. It's the idea that they want to sit on it. But let me listen a little more about what you're sharing, Paul. They're, they're not making up their mind yet, but they're like, I want to hear some more. 
and that's true, that happens here, right, Concord. I've had people, uh, even last uh, service, uh, there's one guy who's come to church many, many weeks, just, just getting more information. More information. We've seen people do that here, and some have come to faith in Jesus eventually. Some have decided, no, we don't want it, and they roll out. Right? That's always going to be true. And some sit on it. I'm going to check this out. But some, this is verse 34, but some men joined him and believed. So there, there's the three responses, right? You hear the, and that's the response you're going to make right this morning. You hear the message of Jesus. Some people sneer at it. Uh, they, they do that with me, right? You, you may not mock me to my face or rag me out or rag another Christian out, uh, but you might leave here and be like, that guy was crazy, man. Leave, he's all t- he mentioned hell like 14 times, and his face was all blistered. You know what I'm saying? So y'all, y'all would like to make fun of me. It's like, he looked like he'd been close to hell. I mean, I can't help it, all right? So, but you may mock when you hear the truth of Jesus. And then some of you may be like, you know what? Maybe I want to listen a little more. And then some people will respond. They're like, I'm going to squeeze this thing. That's exactly what I need. And they turn by repentance from what they used to think, from what they used to feel, from how they used to walk. And they put everything they've got with Christ. Now I want you to look at me, all right, because i got a question for you. This is for those of you who are disciples, because this is talking about becoming obsessed with this idea of disciple making. Um, are you overwhelmed? Y'all look at me eyeball to eyeball right here. Come here. Everybody, I can't go until you're looking. Are you overwhelmed by the lostness of our communities? Listen, d- does that not does that stir you up on the inside? I mean, do you do you not look at crowds of people maybe in Gainesville or Cleveland Square and just think, <laughs> how can these people live without Christ? And then, listen, are you provoked to a point where you're almost ticked off about it? You're like, this is ridiculous. All of these people living for something other than Christ. And you understand it's now a spiritual battle. Do you, do you sense that? Is there something? Listen, that's been my prayer that God would stir me up like that. And that's been my prayer for our church. That we'd be stirred up with stuff like that. So stirred up that it would move us now to do something. Right? Not hide from the culture, not let's create little clubs and hide from everybody who's outside of the faith, but instead to engage the culture with the truth of Jesus. And then are we, are we all right with the fact that some people are going to mock us? Are we all right with the fact that some of you are going to share the gospel of Jesus where you work and people are going to rag you out for it? And there are some people who are going to sit on it and some people are going to be like, I, sort of, I need that. That's what I need. That's what I need. Hey, uh, if Jesus doesn't, um, you know, rapture us up out of here and uh, I die one day, which I, I, I suppose I will, right? And you come to my funeral, here's what I'd love to be said, all right? I'll tell you one thing about Levi. He was good looking. No, I'm just kidding. But here's what I want you to say. <laughs> that was very, I just ruined the whole moment there to anybody else. So uh, I'll tell you one thing about Levi. Man, he was obsessed with making disciples. He wanted people to know Christ. He wanted them to grow in their faith. I can get down with that. Or you know what? Some of you are going to die, and I'm going to preach your funeral. I'd love to stand there and tell everybody who showed up. You know, man, he was obsessed with making disciples. She, she was always trying to, you know, engage people who didn't know Jesus Christ and encourage them to come to faith. Man, obsessed with it. Obsessed. Look at me eyeball to eyeball because this is huge. Everybody's obsessed with something. What are you choosing to be obsessed about? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the ministry of Paul the Apostle and the truth that we find here. And God, we ask that you would uh, place your hand upon each one of us and stir us up within. God, for uh, the times where we have allowed our affections and our hearts to go away from the truth of the gospel, away from Jesus and to the things of this world, uh, God, I pray that you would help us. And then, Lord, for those perhaps maybe here today and they don't have a relationship with you, they don't genuinely know you, maybe they're caught up in religion or one of these other philosophies that we've mentioned today, God, would you redeem them out of that? We'd be quick to give you the praise for it. Draw people to salvation. Your heads bowed, your eyes closed. Uh, You might be here this morning.